BJ clientele in your book, you talk about the, you know, unfortunately seeing your mom get beaten a few times or yes. more than once. Yes. So as that was happening and as you grew up, how did that affect um, you as a kid, but then also yes. what you rapped about and the man that you ended up becoming? Well, you know, one thing is uh, because I grew up with around strong women, it taught me to to at least, you know, in my interactions to respect women much more. And I always I guess I wanted to be more of a protector, you know, than anything else. And and so that informed sort of like my perspective on that piece. But later on, I, I learned that a lot of that violence that was happening was due to substance abuse. And that taught me a lot more about substance abuse as I started to, to you know, study that more and understand, get into the more of the reasons why these things were happening. And um, like I said, the same person that taught compassion when substance was being abused, flipped into a completely different individual. And, and that made me want to protect my mother, seeing that, you know, seeing that kind of stuff happening, seeing some man put hands on her and even, you know, with my own father, um, and, and his, you know, uh, struggles with PTSD and seeing that, um, he eventually had to, had to move out because of that, you know, I mean, and, and I immediately instinctively, whenever that was happening would jump to my mother's side. And that just kind of, it, it, it kind of made me want to be the kind of person that, that would protect, you know, women, if ever I saw that, you know, kind of stuff. So yeah, um, growing up with that, um, wasn't a pretty picture. And I think, I think for me, it, um, it, it, it sort of made me be more aware and more sensitive to um, when, when people who are marginalized or vulnerable or just, just can't help themselves, it, it made me more, you know, uh, compassionate about wanting to help. Gotcha. Okay. And somebody... Also, that helped you that you talk about in your book was uh, Disco Daddy with, yeah. with you guys with the three rapeteers. Yeah. So he was somebody that doesn't get mentioned very often, but that obviously helped start laying this groundwork for what West Coast rap would be. So for you, what did you what made you gravitate toward him and what did you learn under his tutelage as a member of the three rapeteers? Yeah, it's, it's funny, man. Disco, um, he saw us at a, at a, a, a contest, you know, um, sort of a talent show. And he came up to us and we knew who he was, you know, it wasn't like he was a secret to us. He was a celebrity and he came up to us and said, Hey, young man, y'all got something going here, man. Y'all got, y'all got to keep this thing going. Here's my number. And everything you want to call me, you know, you need any advice or anything like that, just hit me up. And so I was like, wow, this is this is real cool to have a celebrity like this dude come up to me or come up to us and and you know encourage us to push us. And he would give me advice about you know just the 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 world of entertainment and the things uh the do's and the don'ts and being professional and you know showing up on time. And, and just working on the craft, getting getting that piece right, making sure that, you know, you you do the best that you can do. And, you know, that's all that you can do is is push yourself to be the best in, in you. And so that inspired me to continue, you know, in the rap game. And, and Disco was, he was just, uh, you know, he, he was just an open book, you know, when it came to, to stuff like that. And it really helped me, like I said, as, as a performer, as an entertainment, and as an entertainer to continue to just you know be inspired even even like sometimes when you didn't feel like it was going in the direction that you wanted it to go or i didn't feel like it was going in the direction that i wanted to you know i thought about those conversations that i had with him whether it was in person or on the phone and just you know just kept going at it because i was like well i don't want to let him down you know and I, I have people that i don't want to let down so that's what uh that's what he helped me to do Gotcha. And, and you're right, man. Not enough conversation is about him or Captain Rap um, and, and those guys who really helped to develop the foundation of West Coast hip hop because, you know, they were doing it. They were doing something, you know, and, 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 and they were in the in the headwinds. You know, they were the tip of the spear, the tip of the tip of the spear. And um, 
it, it sort of opened ways for us. But not only did it open up doors for us, but it also encouraged us because we were like, yo, they're from the West Coast. They can do it. Then, you know, we can do it, too. Yeah, absolutely. It's very uh, important. Um, and I think, too, it's also, as you talk about in your book, it's kind of intriguing that people uh, you kind of detail and document a little bit about the evolution of gangs and how they affected the neighborhoods because yeah. how the the influx of drugs really changed what gang banging was and what it meant to Compton and the other areas that you were in and around. So, yeah. Yeah. and you're talking about the early eighties and getting into the mid eighties around this time in your life and in Los Angeles area. So what, what did you notice? Was it, just crack or was it stuff before that like what was happening that you saw you know see so in 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 at that time period very few people looked at the gangster life as as a glorification or as something that you aspired to or something that you wanted to be now keep in mind all us dudes who grew up in LA and in South LA and in Compton and and and, and Watts and in those areas, we had to have you had to carry yourself with a certain amount of of toughness. Um, there was no sort of like uh, you know weakness to maneuver through, you know, on the daily basis. So. You know, everybody was out there trying to protect their neck. That that wasn't that wasn't the issue. So when when people got into the gangster life at that time, it was either from you know a relative or or, or somebody that sort of encouraged them, or just their sort of small pocket or group of friends that they were around. But when the shift from the East Coast to the West Coast in terms of the sale distribution of crack cocaine came about a lot of the young guys who were sort of on the on the uh, edges of the gangster life saw that wait a minute the gangs are now making money because the gangs would sort of mark off territory and say hey we're going to sell here here and here these are our spots but as they started doing that and more and more people started to become addicted to crack cocaine, it started to, they started to make a lot of money. So that was attractive to a lot of young guys who may have been on the fence or just, you know, gang associated, gang affiliated. They started to get more formalized into gang culture because gang culture correlated with the 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 rise in the crack ep epidemic that started to pull more and more people over to that side i saw a lot of my friends get caught up in that some of them didn't make it out of that either they were you know brutally murdered or they ended up in prison and for me i used to learn a couple of ways one just through informed and, and, and doing my own research, but I also learned from seeing what other people would go through. And what affected me the most is when I when I had friends that that not only were affected by it, but you know, were were murdered, were killed. Some of them I had just talked to like the day of, the day before, the next thing I know, I hit the corner next to our apartment complex, and here's one of my friends with his brain splattered all over, you know, um, the outside of my bedroom window. So, and then hearing gunshots and police, you know, helicopters and just the, the, the treatment that we started to receive from law enforcement and the stories you would hear and, and things that you would witness. I'm like, this is a bad scene. And this is not something that is, is it can't be good for us. And so I started seeing more and more of that. And, and that uh, started to, you know, form a lot of my opinions about, um, you know where society was headed but yeah it it was um it, it started out really like five percent maybe you know <clears throat> of the cats in the neighborhood would would uh maybe gang bang or associate with gang banging then it went then at some point it just shifted it went from five percent to like you know 75 percent. it's like whoa you know this is this is crazy and it had a lot to do with the distribution and sale of of crack cocaine
But before that, man, it was it was just smaller pockets of, of gangs and people affiliating with smaller, you know, factions um, at that time. Yeah. Well, fortunately for you, you were able to uh, avoid that uh, and focus a lot yeah. on music on music. And one of the other things I, I found interesting about reading in your book, uh, DJ Clientel autobiography was the uh, invasion, for, invasion force DJ crew with Joe Cooley and McKinley because Joe Cooley, like yourself, is another artist, DJ, amazing talent that I think doesn't get enough discussion or attention. So early on, as you're developing your own DJ skills, since I hold Joe Cooley up toward the highest of the high rankings, what did you notice about him early on uh, that made him so special? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so Joe and I met because we lived in the same housing complex uh, called Eugenia Village, which is right there by um, uh, Centennial High School. Well, it's not there anymore. They tore it down because they found out that it was some toxic, you know, shit in the water. And, you know, we sucking on that crap every day, drinking it. But anyway, um, I think it was Exxon Mobil or somebody that had some underground wells, whatever. But so Joe and I, every every uh, every weekend, there was this big field in the middle of the complex. We called it the big field. And there were two sides to the complex. It was Clovis and Wadsworth. I lived on the Wadsworth side. Joe lived on the Clovis side. And so we'd get together and we play tackle football against each other, right? So it was Wad Wadsworth against Clovis, Clovis against Wads Wadsworth. Sometimes you know, we, one side didn't have one side didn't have enough players. Then the other side would, you know, would, you know, loan us some players. But Joe and I struck up a friendship at first, you know, as uh, playing football against each other. And then eventually when the whole DJ thing and the MC thing and the rap thing, hip hop thing started to, to you know, started to grow. Um, we say, hey, man, let's 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 form our own little crew, you know. And, you know, we didn't know the first thing about it, really. We were just trying to, you know, figure it all out. So we started going to, like, dances like uh, Uncle Jam's Army. We started going to uh, Eve After Dark, seeing DJ Yella do his thing, seeing, you know, e Egyptian Lover do his thing. We'd go to different, you know, parties and stuff to try to figure this whole DJ thing out. We had, like, really cheap turntables. Um, we'd borrow each other's equipment. And, you know, um, it was a ragtag, you know, situation at first. But um, we met up with two other guys. Uh, Joe had eventually moved deeper into Compton. So we met up with these two other guys, one a guy named uh, New York Nick. And, and Nick was actually from New York. He, he had a um, sort of this, this karate business. And he was a, uh, he was a black belt and he, he taught others in, in martial arts. And we had this other cat, this goofy dude named Carlos. And um, so we formed this four man crew called the Invasion Force. Carlos rapped a little bit. Uh, Nick was more of the, the guy who would sort of help us get equipment. Um, he had he was the only one with a real job. So um, he kind of helped us with the money situation and supported us financially. And me and Joe kind of did most of the heavy lifting in terms of the entertainment piece. We would borrow the turntables, you know, we take we'd all take our turn, you know, on the 1200s, but Joe would hog them the most. So I had to eventually start going over to Joe's house to if I wanted to practice and I would come over to his house six in the morning and, you know, he's up practicing and probably hadn't brushed his teeth yet, probably hadn't taken a shower or anything yet. So I'm sitting there waiting, waiting. OK, man, it's two hours, three hours, it's four hours. Hey, man, I'm going to get something to eat, man. You want something? I'll be back. I leave. I'd be gone for two, three hours. I come back. He's still on the turntables trying to perfect one single scratch. You know, I mean, that dude was dedicated to the hilt to to really trying to, you know, perfect the scratch thing. Once we when we started going to the clubs and, and, and the parties and Uncle Jams and started really studying what they were doing and hearing uh, scratches, you know, by like Grandmaster Flash and people like that. We wanted to start of perfect that. Plus, we had another influence, a local influence, which doesn't get a, not, a lot of credit himself, Mix, Mixmaster Spade. And so we would buy Spade and mixtapes, not necessarily to listen to the music, but just to listen to the scratching and how he was doing that. 
and we would so we studied all of these DJs and and then eventually we started coming up sort of like with our own styles and with our own scratches and with our own um uh you know techniques and because Joe was Joe's a southpaw he's left-handed um when when we would practice together and do our routines I would sort of have to intuitively move to sort of his side of things so I became ambidextrous as a DJ but it helped me it just helped me as a DJ to be a better DJ now I'm not saying that I'm as I'm as good as Joe because it certainly wasn't because I really focused more on you know the rap side but I wasn't too shabby you know when it came down to it um I was hanging with him you know and and so Joe but Joe was a, 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 a he had a he had a strong work ethic and DJing was something and scratching, particularly, you know, the fast scratching and stuff was something that he was particularly into. And we didn't have a fader at that time. We didn't have that cross fader. We were turning with knobs, you know, or, or moving the fader up and down. So that was a whole, we had to, that was a whole different, uh, you know, kind of uh, element, you know, that we were working with. But yeah, that dude was, that dude was hardcore when it came to the DJ. Man. No joke. Absolutely. And Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gang bang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.